Hello, everybody. You're listening to Fireside Paranormal Podcast. My name is Jordan Klein. My guest today is Keith Evans. He is the author of Hayes House. Ghosts are people, too. Before we get to him, I do want to mention American Paranormal Magazine. Their issue coming out for February is about lycanthropy. So if any werewolf fans out there, make sure you check that out. And Wicked Cat Clothing. If you go on our Facebook page, fireside paranormal hub uh she has actually put up a survey uh, asking a few questions about her brand and at the end of the survey you get a ten dollar gift code spooky season doesn't just last a month shop wicked cat clothing year round get your horror paranormal spooky and halloween apparel go to wickedcatclothing.com and shop apparel and accessories now and you can save 30 percent off with code fireside 30 With our featured story, I want to make sure you guys know, if you send in a story to us and you have, let's say, a YouTube channel, or if you have a podcast or a band and play music, make sure you plug it. You know, we are totally cool with with you promoting what you do. I think it's uh, really neat. Um, We have a lot of really talented folks that that, uh, are listeners and interact with us on on our Facebook group, so we know you're out there, so don't be afraid to to plug what you're doing i know this week's featured story is from a new podcaster in pittsburgh and we're going to go to her now this is michelle all right um i'm michelle voss i'm from pittsburgh pa and we have a podcast called nightmare potluck we just started it and we're starting to we're starting by going through pittsburgh urban legends and our experiences in our hometown first and then branching out from there we'll start to include other areas in pennsylvania and then go through some of the experiences that we've already had while traveling to Ohio, West Virginia, and the surrounding states. Going from there. <laughs> okay, well, I have a lot of stories, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep it short. I'll, I'll keep it to one, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start out with this one because I am looking for anyone who's had a similar experience. This one I don't remember personally. I was just told it, and it was by many, many witnesses. Um, There was a centennial in our hometown, it's Millville, PA, and there was a man walking through, he wasn't part of the parade, he was just a, you know, a guy, and it's a small town, so everyone kind of knew each other, and I was too young to remember, so I was only about maybe two, three years old, and I, when I was looking at this man, really, I was really concentrated on him for a young person that doesn't have any attention, watching him, watching him, and I looked a little bit afraid, and so everyone, you know, my mom who was holding me and my grandfather asked, what's the matter? And what I described about him was a shadow, um, but it wasn't on the ground. I said, it's walking next to him, you know, and I I described what this was, and and that it, it was following him, it was right beside him, keeping step with him, and he died the next day. (laughs) Yes, so I'm like, well, I would have given me up for adoption at that point, first of all. But next of all, I'm like, I've heard things about shadow people. I've, I've heard, you know, a lot about that, but I've never heard anyone say that they've ever seen anything like that where they've seen a shadow walking beside a person and then that happens. You know, I, and I've heard of people that can see auras and everything, that, but I've never heard that described. So I'm actively, like, looking for a person who's ever witnessed this before. Um, now, I live in a house. It was built in 1886. And I had a, a guy, and he's from um, Odd, Oddcast Pittsburgh. He's a historian. His name is John Chokowski, and he did some research on my house. And he found out that, you know, being an old house, there were a lot of people that died there. Um, my stepdad used to joke around a lot about this lady, Hilda, that, that had died in the house, and he would play all kind of tricks on us. Like, he, her mail would still come to the house. And he's like, why is she still getting mail? They should know she, this is the church that buried her. Maybe she's not dead. And he would like throw it into the, into the basement and everything and try to scare us. Well, so I, that was all that I knew who died there. But uh, there have been like many, many things that happened in this house. 
Now, one of the things is that my son used to see a kid, and he he saw this kid like growing up in the house, and seemed he but he was like he was like aged with him. So I'm like, all right, well, what kind of ghost does that? You know, what I mean, what is he seeing? Is this just like a like a really imaginary friend that like he's continued on for all these years? We described him as like this dirty ash, ashy blonde hair, whatever, and can't quite see the eyes. And but never, it was never like a malicious thing. It was almost like a, like a little playful thing. And everything that's happened in the house was kind of playful, okay. And so I have this dream where I'm wake, I wake up out of the bed, go around to the side. I'm just you know going to the bathroom in the middle of the night. I go to turn the light on in the hallway, and I feel a hand on my hand, and it's cold. So I pull it back, and the light comes on, and I see this. I'm seeing the switch, and there's nothing on the switch. So I look downstairs where there's another switch, and there's a little boy right there, and it's this kid that my my son had described. He's down the step, and then I look, and he's right beside me, and I look down again, and there's two of them standing there, and they're like laughing, like giggling, like they've played a trick on me. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. Now, this was just a dream. I woke up after this, and so it was obviously just a dream. But whenever John investigated the house, he had found out that twins had died there. So I don't know if it's these twins. I don't know how they are aging in the house. They seem to have stopped around seven or eight years old, but we have dreams about these kids, and people have had experiences with little things like being tickled, um, just little kind of tricks being played in this house. So if you, if you want to investigate a house, too, <laughs> it's, it's probably haunted but not malicious, come to my house. <laughs> um, it is Nightmare Podcast, bo- Nightmare Potluck Podcast. Thank you very much, Michelle. And like I said before, if you would like to have your story as one of our featured stories, make sure you email me at firesideparanormalpodcast at gmail.com. And again, I open that up to paranormal teams, too. If you have an investigation team and you have some evidence or something neat that you just want to share with us, some kind of story from a, one of your investigations, we'd love to add that onto our show as well. So make sure you reach out to us. All right, I want to get to my guest. Join me by the fire as we welcome Keith Evans. He is the author of The Hayes House. Ghosts are people, too. Keith, you with us? Yes, I'm here. Sir, tell me about this book. Well, the Hayes House Ghosts are People too are about two small-town families that uh, lived at the Hayes House. The Buck family built it, the Hayes House, in 1908, and they lived there until Jeff Buck passed away around 1922. And then uh, the family gave the Hayes House back to the bank, and the bank had the Hayes House until the Hayes family moved in, which, of course, gave the Hayes house its present mm-hmm. name, or at least the name I used in the book. So, and they moved in uh, around World War II, 1942, and the Hayes family lived there until the last Hayes family member moved and uh, left the house in 1996. So it, it is mainly about six or seven the nicest ghosts you'd ever want to meet. Uh, the private ghosts, they they don't want to share everything with you, and uh, they like want to make sure that not too much of their business is out there on the street. So, you know, they have the same consciousness and human personality that they had before they passed away. Uh, but as I gained their confidence, and as they realized that, uh, you know, having a book about their house would kind of allow their house to live on forever, at least uh, as far as the written word goes. So I think the ghosts of spirits were for it. And they seem to all care about the Hayes house. From the Buck family, you had Jeff Buck. You also had his oldest son. Uh, and you had his youngest daughter. She had a, a unusual name, and I got more than one spelling of her name, uh-huh. but it was like Emmeline or Emmeline or something like that. Now, I, that I do the, know a few Emmelines. It, it, it was similar to that, but I, I had gotten a couple different spellings of his youngest daughter's name, and I couldn't find anything legal to put, uh, 
you know, a definite spelling to it. But uh, I feel that uh, the three members from the Buck family, and then at least four or five members from the uh, Gibson family, uh, Pat and Kathleen Hayes, which were husband and wife, uh, their mother, Amy Hayes, well, Pat's mother, and also um, Pat's aunt, which was Sunshine Gibson, and then a, a family friend who had lived at the house for a long time, Mary. All of these ghosts of spirits seem to be there looking after the house. And I think a lot of times when the house stays uh, 90% or more original, that allows the ghost of spirits to still see that it's their house, it's the house they lived in when they were alive, and it makes them want to stay there and take care of the house, even though I feel that ghosts of spirits are not stuck where they're at. They choose to stay where they're at. Similar to how, you know, human beings choose to live where they want to live within their economic restraints. Let me ask you this, because, uh, you know, most folks have never heard of the Hayes House. Uh, where is it? And, uh, you know, how how long has it been going on, you know, in its current haunted state? Well, there, there's actually uh, at least two other books about Hayes Houses in other states. But the Hayes House I wrote about is in Apalachicola, Florida, which is up on the panhandle of Florida, not too far, about maybe 60 miles from Tallahassee, Florida. Mm -hmm. yep. And uh, the Hayes House is near the uh, Gulf of Mexico. And, you know, Florida is very rich in uh, paranormal happening. I think it is because... Uh, it's close to the water, and I think uh, ghosts and spirits are just electromagnetic energy, and I feel that they travel along the water since water has a uh, electrical charge to it. It's ionic, actually. It has a positive and a negative charge. Yeah, I definitely agree. You know, water is a, a conductor, I guess. Conducer, conductor. I don't know the proper yeah. grammatical there. But uh, definitely there's a lot of activity around water most of the time. Now, with this house, what are some of the stories that happened in the house? Well, um, I virtually had heard nothing about uh, the house other than I had completed paranormal research in a nearby business where several of the family members had worked uh, over a probably 50-year period. And the paranormal activity was so good there, I thought, well, you know, the Buck family also lived next door in what I call the Hayes house, uh -huh. and the Hayes family also lived next door uh, from where they had worked in the Hayes house. And I thought, I bet the paranormal research would be good there. So I just started out uh, trying to contact the owner, and the owner lived in Atlanta, and she was an artist. and. Uh, she used the house like as a bed and breakfast and uh, also like a studio for uh, art uh, artists that could rent out space so they could do their work in, you know, quiet and private. Okay. That's neat. And um, it was hard to catch the owner. And I tried about three times. And on the third time, I knocked on the door and the owner came to the door and I told her who I was. I was a paranormal researcher and I'd like to write a book about the Hayes house but I would need her written permission. And usually when I talk to people like that, the look on their face, they have a look of terror or fear, <laughs> and I know the answer will be no. Even though they don't say no, they just never contact me again once I give them their business card. But this owner, she just smiled. And I knew when she smiled, she was going to say yes, and she did. So that's how the... Uh, starting of the uh, book, The Hayes House, uh, began. Now, had she been having some activity in the place? To the best of my knowledge, no. I, uh, I've, i over the years, well, I published uh, The Hayes House Goes for People too in, what, uh, August of 2018. I have received text messages from different people. Uh, I used to be on Facebook. Now I'm just on Instagram. And I still get text messages where people say, I had a chance to visit there 
or, or stay there a couple of nights or live there. And they say the house has definitely got paranormal activity. But all, all positive stuff, uh, nothing negative. But people knew that someone was there other than living people. Now, you are a researcher. I'm guessing that you, um, when writing the book, you decided to do some research of your own in the home. So what did you, uh, what did you come up with? Well, I mainly came up with, uh, I tried to look at the history of what the ghosts of spirits did so I could have an intellectual conversation with them that would stimulate them to want to respond. So, you know, I, I did research and, you know, and, and found out that uh, uh, the different properties that the Hayes family had owned in the area I have found out that the Hayes family uh, had actually uh, at one time had owned a, uh, uh, I think it's called Turpentine, but it was some type of uh, um, sap that is uh, distilled from pine tree needles. Okay. So I found that out so I could ask questions that related to something that might stimulate a response. I also found out that Pat Hayes liked to go dove hunting. I, I'm not sure why anyone would want to shoot a dove because they look like they're small birds, but that was one thing he enjoyed doing. And he used to go to an island uh, off of Apalachicola, which is now, it was purchased by, I think, the federal government. It could be the state. But they turned it into just like a bird sanctuary. They won't allow anyone to live there now. But he used to actually go hunting there. So I try to find out little tidbits about what uh, the individuals that are now deceased, what they did when they were alive. For instance, I found out that uh, uh, Pat and Kathleen enjoyed playing uh, cards. Uh, Kathleen was a member of bridge clubs at least maybe two bridge clubs over a 20-year period. Uh, So that gave me something to respond to, Uh and it also allowed me to figure out, well, when Kathleen said bridge, when I did my first paranormal research at the Hayes house, she wasn't talking about the bridge that people drive over. (laughs) She was talking about the card game bridge. So it gives you a little bit more clarification as to the data that I received when I did my paranormal research, especially with my Atlas 5B. And what is that for those of you, for those folks that, uh, here, here's what I like to do just so you know, um, a lot of times we have new, new people into the paranormal that listen. So, uh, right. so they might not know what that is. So, if you want to tell them well, what that... Yes. Uh, Obelisk 5B um, is a little box that theoretically a ghost or spirit can use their electromagnetic energy to choose words from the database within the Obelisk 5B. And uh, it's made by digital dowsing, uh, which you can find them on uh, the internet. Um uh, so, so most you people actually, like you. You'll hear them called um, ghost boxes, spirit boxes, um, ITC research. Some folks call. So you'll you'll hear all those you know terms with, along with what he's talking about now. It's similar, but I think uh, the Obelisk Five is better than some of those in some ways because you don't have all that static. Okay. Uh, most ghost box, you just have that annoying static. And having hearing loss, I might not be able to understand what some people say, but that static comes in loud and clear, <laughs> and it drives me up the wall. <laughs> and a lot of times on some of these so-called, like the SB5 or SB11, SB7s, they it's hard for me to understand what's been said. You know, I know a word has been spoken or a fraction of a word, but I don't always understand 
what you know, I, I can hear it, but it doesn't really sound like a word to me. So with the Obelisk Five, not only does it speak the word, which sometimes I don't hear or don't understand, but it gives you a digital display of the last three words that it has spoken. Well, that's so that way you get some type of clarification. And I've also noticed with the Oblis 5B, it may give you a word, but you don't actually get it on the display. It's almost like you hear it, but it's not on the display. Mm. So I don't know how ghosts of spirits are doing that. <laughs> now, one time, this didn't happen at the Hayes house. This happened at a swimming pool. And uh, I was doing some paranormal research there. And um, I hadn't turned the Oblis 5 on yet. Because I usually, when I do my uh, uh, videos for YouTube, I usually, you know, announce myself and say where I'm at and what the date is and stuff like that. And then I heard like someone talking, but it sound like the same sounds and voices that I hear when I use the Oblis 5B. And I looked at the Oblis 5B and it was off. So anyway, sometimes it's almost like ghosts can use it even though I haven't physically turned it on. So in, in you know, it, well, that's neat. I actually had a tape of it, but you could actually hear it, but it just sounded like, ah, 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 like that. To me, it didn't make, you could hear it on the video. Uh, so if you watch my YouTube, I think it was like last May, May of 2021. Uh, and, you know, I was near the pool, but maybe a person with better hearing might be able to make out the sound and know what they're saying. Now, I do want to say it's really neat, too. Most, you know, paranormal investigators aren't as in-depth with the history. I know everybody likes to have some kind of history, you know, of the house that they're going into. But you really researched every single person in that house and what they like to do kind of before going into the paranormal uh, aspect of it, correct? I try to, but I didn't actually get to do that when I got permission to do the Hayes house. And one reason was they put the house up for sale. Oh. And I had no idea uh, whether I would be able to, you know, complete. I, I did paranormal sessions in at least two one-hour paranormal sessions in each room at the Hayes house. So the Hayes house has like 20 different rooms counting the three porches. So I had to hurry along. I didn't really have a lot of time to prepare because I wasn't sure, you know, if, you know, had they sold it, then that would have just, I would have had to got written permission from the next owner, which may have not given me that. I understand that. So you did all your research then after to connect what the EVPs were that you were catching. I did a lot of it uh, during... I did some before uh, because uh, these individuals, I had actually did paranormal research at locations where they had worked. So I had some of it before, some of it after, some of it during, because I take my time when I do paranormal research. I try to find places that will allow me to, you know, spend maybe a couple hours today, uh -huh. uh, take a three days off, come back and spend a couple hours. I don't just go in and spend like, uh, you know, two or three days and make my decision and that's it. And I think by doing that, it allows the ghosts of spirits to build up an opinion on whether they like me and want to talk to me, whether they trust me with this information, you know, and every ghost of spirit communicates in a different way. You know, say some ghosts might be very good at disembodied voices other ghosts might be good at blinking a light. Uh, other ghosts might be good at setting off your car alarm. <laughs> so it, it it is strange. It's like they've kind of refined a certain way. Like, for instance, uh, uh, Pat uh, Hayes' mother, uh, Annie uh, Gibson Hayes, she was good at causing my camera to go 
unfocused. And I don't know if that's because she was in front of the camera. Her family said she loved to have her picture taken. So anytime oh. my camera was unfocused without any good reason, I felt that was happening. And I was able, I, I, I lost a lot of my pictures during Hurricane. Uh, actually, all the pictures I had taken during my paranormal research at the Hayes house, all my thermal images, all my videos were lost. Oh, no. Hurricane Michael. But prior to Hurricane Michael, I was able to go to a relative's house of uh, Sunshine Gibson, and I was able to take pictures of her music box. And during that whole period of time, uh, this was Annie Gibson's music box. The whole time, my camera was out of focus. And I knew then that it's definitely some, uh, definitely uh, Annie uh, Gibson Hayes that was uh, causing it to go out of focus. That was kind of like her calling card. <laughs> That's awesome. Now, what other kind of neat stories did you get out of there? What other kind of experiences? Well, there was all, all types of experiences. Uh, um, with my thermal imager, uh, TG165, I was able to, um, at the time, I didn't even know it was Pat and Kathleen's room. But I went in there. I used to do like a quick uh, south wall, west wall, uh, north wall, east wall, ceiling, floor, just a quick roundabout to see, you know, what the actual room looks like. Uh, and then, you know, I started my paranormal investigation, and all of a sudden, in the corner, it looks like there's a ice-cold pipe that runs from the um, northeast corner of the floor of the room up the wall to the top where the ceiling is. And I thought, you know, I had to take my eyes away from the screen of the TG-165 thermal imager and actually look at the wall to see that there was nothing there. It was just looked like a normal wall. But when I looked back at the uh, uh, thermal imager, uh, in the corner it was just like a blue pipe from floor to ceiling. Uh. And um, I came to determine that that was Pat uh, Hayes. Pat Hayes was like, he was like six foot three, but he had like a 20, he had like a 29 inch waist. He was a very thin person. I mean, I'm like 5'7", and I have like a 38-inch waist. So he was very thin, and I think that's the way he chose to appear um, via the thermal imager. And then I immediately turned around to check the other walls to see, are all the, all the corners going to look like this? So when I turned and done like a... Uh, 680 directly behind me was the southwest wall and I looked for the southwest wall and it, it looked normal and then all of a sudden it looked like uh, dark blue images almost like a silhouette I don't know if, if you ever done target uh, shooting where you had a pop up target of silhouette yep, yep. it looked like two to three silhouettes they would like kind of undulate from two to three. And they, you could just see like the head, which a darker color, either dark blue or black. And, you know, compared to the rest of the ambient temperature was like somewhere between 60 and 70 room temperature, which is probably like a purplish, pinkish type color. So anyway, I thought those Three, two to three different undulating silhouettes that were kind of like dark blue to black were Kathleen Hayes, uh, who lived also at the Hayes house, married to Pat Hayes, and uh, Annie Gibson Hayes, which was Pat's mother, who had a room and visited the Hayes house uh, just about every weekend. And uh, the third undulating uh would be uh, Sunshine Gibson, which was Annie's uh, sister and the aunt of Pat Hayes, who she lived at the Hayes house. So anyway, I at first I thought 
if this many ghosts are, you know, allowing me to see them on thermal imaging, do they want me here? And I kind of felt like, well, should I be doing it if these ghosts and spirits don't want me here? Mm. And I think one mistake I make, which a lot of people do, and I'm guilty of it too, whenever there's a overwhelming presence of any type of ghost, we think negatively that they don't want us here. And I, I was wondering, should I stop doing my paranormal investigations and just give up on the book? That's what was running through my mind. And I thought, well, the ghosts and spirits don't want me here. Are they going to cooperate? And will I get enough good data to actually write a book about? So when I left the Hayes house that day, I was kind of wondering what I should do. And believe it or not, I forgot all about that situation until I actually uh, got ready to write the book. <laughs> and what I would do Every time I did a paranormal session, hour-long paranormal session, while I was doing the session, I would take notes. I had a, I don't know shorthand, but I had my own type of shorthand where I could jot stuff down, and right after the paranormal session, I'll sit down for an hour and like fill in the blanks and change my shorthand into a longhand so I could understand it, you know, six or seven months later when I get ready to do the book. So the bottom line is, it's almost like the ghost of spirits helped me to forget that situation because they weren't liking where I was going with it since I interpreted it in a negative way. And I think far too many people, when they receive uh, communication or paranormal activity, they take it in a negative way. Uh -huh. And it's sad because... In most cases, I don't feel that the ghosts or spirits are trying to be negative at all. Now, how often do you go on on these, you know, investigations and you get that kind of of evidence? I know as far as like thermal imaging goes, that's that's a good one to get. That's a you know, especially if you have several different silhouettes of of people showing up. How often do you get evidence like that? It's rare, very rare. You can spend hours with your. Uh, thermal imager and not not see anything uh, that's unexplained you'll you'll see, definitely see a cold area if you point it towards the AC vent yeah. and the AC is on <clears throat> but it is very rare it is one tool that's good to have but usually <clears throat> I don't get that much with it in the Hayes house there was only one other e occasion where I was able to pick up uh, a cold area. And I had taken uh, uh, photos of the uh, screen of the Flare TG165. And I have one photo that survived uh, Hurricane Michael because I had emailed it to myself. If only I had Lucky. a fault to email all the other pictures to myself. Right? <laughs> but in in this photo, you really have to look hard because it doesn't look any different. Uh, if I had the other photos that show what it looked like, you know, I, I think I took maybe three photos of the back stairway. I was in the back stairway room, and I was asking a question to the ghost of spirits as far as the stairs did they come in a different direction? Because I felt that whoever had built the house would not have ended the stairway. Uh, it came down and ended like right in the middle of the framing for the interior door that went into the kitchen. And I thought, this guy, he would not have done that. He, he was wealthy enough to build a you know large house like this he would he would have had the stairway come differently. He wasn't skimping on the staircase. Well, I just felt that he would have probably put in a second landing and brought the steps down towards the center of the room. And that's what I was asking the ghost. And then on the thermal image, it was like the ghost was standing there with one leg over the railing. And you could see it. It was like dark. You could just see the silhouette. Uh, it looked like a man 
with one leg over the railing. And then there were other pictures where that was not there at all. So I think that's the only two times that I remember. Oh, there was a third time. Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to think. Now, this may have happened after I wrote the book, but there was actually a time where I was uh, on the second floor front porch. And I think this was after the book was completed. But uh, the same owner still owned the house, and I was still able to complete some paranormal research there. And um, I I had shined the um, flare. This was during the day. And I was looking at the kind of like a silver bright uh, roof that had been put on the Hayes house uh, sometime after caffeine had sold it. And I was trying to see if I could get a hotter temperature from the heat. And then there was like an area that was dark. And I just couldn't explain where that dark area was coming from because the the shiny surface will reflect heat uh -huh, and white yeah. doesn't absorb heat as much as black. But at the same time, it won't, there won't be any cool area. So I didn't understand that. And um, I think I put that at least on Instagram. And at the time, I may have still been on Facebook. But um, that was that was the third in like three times out of uh, all the paranormal research that I did at the Hayes House, and I must have done at least uh, twenty chapters that had paranormal research, and at least two hours, uh, two one-hour sessions. So that would be over forty hours of paranormal research, and there was only at least two or three occasions that I ever received any type of paranormal data from my thermal imager. Uh, I was going to say that's a, that's quite the catch. You know, if you got that every, you know, every time you went out now, you had mentioned before that you do have a YouTube channel. Yes. Can you tell us about that? I know you're pretty active on that. My YouTube channel is paranormal short sessions by Keith Evans. And I try to uh, put something on uh, YouTube every day. Um, I have a lot of old paranormal short sessions that uh, I was putting on Facebook when they would allow videos that were only like one or two minutes long. Mm -hmm. So I think I went back and pretty much put everything on that I had from, say, <clears throat> uh, 2018 and 2019. And I try to do something uh, every day. It's hard, too, because you want something new and something fresh. And I even uh, find things that, you know, I, I <clears throat> if I notice something unusual, like bubbles coming from a pool vent, uh -huh. when all the other pool vents don't have bubbles, I'll document that because you can't rule out that it's not some way that a ghost or spirit's trying to get your attention. And also things like I have I purchased a digital alarm clock right after uh, Hurricane Michael, which was uh, in fact I was living at the Hayes house after Hurricane Michael. I rented apartment three because the place I was staying in Mexico Beach was you know completely destroyed. So you ended up living at the Hayes house? For from uh the very end of October 2018 up until they sold it which was about uh 4 months later uh at the end of February uh 2019. <clears throat> but I lost everything during the storm surge so I purchased a uh digital uh, alarm clock and I still had that digital alarm clock and I would notice whenever I would do paranormal research getting near that digital alarm clock my uh, mail meter would just go crazy with uh, you know lots of electromagnetic spikes and then it, as I would move away from the digital alarm clock they, they would just stop and then I also noticed uh, with my uh, Obelisk 5 if I get close to the digital alarm clock, 
I get like a lot of uh, words, you know. If I'm talking, the words will stop. It's if they're listening to what I'm saying, and then I'll get words. And if I move three feet away, it'll stop. So I thought, well, this is neat. i got to start putting this on, uh, you know, videotaping it and putting it on because, you know, at first I think, well, who wants to know about my alarm clock, you know? But anyway, um, I try to put things like that on because it is very difficult to get uh, verbal or written permission to do uh, the old Victorian homes. I think a lot of people are afraid that if uh, anyone thinks it's got paranormal activity, that the property value will drop. Where if if every person that enjoys doing paranormal research uh, had the money, <laughs> right? houses like that, the property value would go up. Yeah, I think it's pretty crazy that the, um, you know, people don't embrace that paranormal tourism because there is some money to be made in some of these places. I mean, look at, uh, you know, a lot of these big hospitals and, and you know, prisons that, that folks do these tours at. They spend lots of money every year just to be there for a few hours. So it's pretty crazy to me. Yeah, I checked out some of the smaller places, and, uh, you know, they they want like three to $400 a day. You know, and, and unless you have a team, which I've, I've never worked as a team. I've always worked as like the Lone Ranger, and um, that that's kind of stiff for the Lone Ranger. And I think I get more paranormal data because most ghosts of spirits are comfortable talking to one person. Just like most people feel comfortable talking to one person, one-on-one. -on -one. But if they have to go in and talk to a group, they're worried about maybe stumbling over their words or pronouncing a word wrong or somebody laughing at them. And, you know, so ghosts and spirits are the same way. They keep that same personality even after they pass away. And I think they feel much more comfortable, you know, talking to me because I'm just that one person. So... Anyway, that's just my thoughts on it. So tell me about your your investigation style. I mean, you're going into these places by yourself with all your equipment sitting in the dark. I mean, how, how do you do it, and what kind of places do you like to go into? Well, a lot of places that I have received permission, say like the Hayes House, it was very hard to be alone. There was always someone there, a living person there, which <clears throat> I needed to do paranormal research, but I realized that it was kind of contaminating what I was doing because I wasn't sure whether those steps up the back stairway was a ghost or whether those steps up the back stairway was a person actually oh, that would be tough. walking up the back. So <clears throat> in a lot of places that I've done paranormal research, it's next to impossible to be by yourself. I try to do paranormal research during the day because I videotape everything. And a lot of times if ghost spirits do something, it's just like, say, they might move an ashtray. They might turn it maybe 90 degrees from where it was orient oriented on the, say, coffee table. If you're in the dark, you're going to miss little things like that. And most Ghosts of spirits are very subtle in what they do and what movements they take. It's almost like they're gingerly trying not to frighten anyone who's living. You know, they don't want to cause someone to be alarmed. So I like to do my paranormal research during the day when I have good lighting and where I can catch anything that happens. And, of course, I also like to sleep at night. So... <laughs> Um, at nighttime, you know, you might have more people asleep and, and less road traffic as far as less people driving to contaminate your paranormal area. Uh, but your lighting is another problem. And uh, it, it's very hard for me to just have enough funding to just buy 
a motel out and buy every room. So I make sure nobody's there. So a lot of times, if I get permission to do a motel, I'll explain to the owner that I get better paranormal activity if I'm like the only person in the motel. So I tell them, I want people to check out at 11 o'clock. I want to start at 11 o'clock when everyone's checked out. And when people start to check in around 3 and 4 in the afternoon, I want to stop because then there's too many people. And it's like ghosts of spirits are like if there's a bar in the motel or a restaurant, those of spirits are probably down in the bar listening to what people are talking about or, you know, looking at the TV if a football game's on. And they're not going to want to just sit and talk to me because I'm doing paranormal research. So I really feel that you have to catch the location when there's not another game in town, when you're like the only one that the ghost of spirits can communicate with because then that way they're going to pay some attention to you. That's a really interesting take on it. Uh, you know, most most uh, groups want to do it at night where they can control, you know, what light is coming in or out, and it's usually quiet. But you're wanting right in the middle of the day, like, hey, if I don't want to, you know, fight with their attention, <laughs> you know. So if they're out walking around at the bar, I'm going to catch them because I got a recorder right there, even though it's noon. That's pretty cool. I agree, and I, I catch a lot of evidence, but... I also put a lot of time in, and um, the longer you're at a location, you kind of build like a relationship. And once the ghost trusts you, and I always tell them what I plan to do. If I'm going to, if I hope to write a book, I tell them I would like to write a book. If I'm, you know, going to put it on social media, I try to tell them that's what I'm going to do. And once they gain my trust, then they know what they want to say. You know, a ghost of spirit don't want to spill their guts about how they died or how they feel about their mother dying or, you know, they don't want to say something that everyone's going to know about because they're self-conscious about it. Yeah. So once I tell them I'm going to use it for social media, then, you know, don't say anything you wouldn't want the whole world to hear. Then some ghosts might say, all right, I'm not going to talk to this guy at all. Another ghost, you can you can talk to him. <laughs> and some ghosts might say, hey, I got stuff I want to talk about. And, um, you know, I, I really feel that there's pros and cons to using the Oculus 5B. And one of the pros is you get direct communication from a ghost or spirit, which is nice. But there are a lot of cons to using the Oblis 5B. And one of the cons is that it takes a lot of a ghost of spirit's energy. And once that ghost of spirit runs out of energy, oh. they're not going to be able to choose words. And I really feel that there's a learning curve with the uh, Oblis 5. A new ghost might get in there and say, I don't know how to choose words, you know. There, that ghost or spirit might be in there and not be able to figure out how to use it. So that's another uh, negativity about the Obelisk 5. And also, ghosts and spirits may be talking in sentences rapidly, but the Obelisk 5 is only going to pick up bits and pieces. That's another negative about the Obelisk 5. You're going to have to subjectively fill in the blanks with what you heard and what you think they probably meant by Uh those couple words. And another negative thing is the Oblis 5 can't control how many ghosts of spirits are communicating at the same time. Just like with my digital alarm clock, sometimes I feel like my digital alarm clock is like a, a ghost or spirit condominium or a ghost of spirit nightclub where there might be a hundred ghost of spirits, you know, at one time. And if I allow all of them to choose one word, I might have a hundred words and all those words might be the first word of a hundred different sentences from a hundred different ghosts. And it's not going to make any sense. So even though I love the Oblis 5B and it does 
give you a word that you can hear and look at if you don't hear it. Uh, there are things about it which, you know, can allow it to not be a good tool at all. That's very neat. Very interesting. Uh, let me ask you this. Where can folks find your book? Um, my book is only online. Uh, it's sold at Amazon, uh, eBay, depending on what country you're in. If you're if you're in uh, Australia, Ireland, Great Britain, and Canada, uh, Amazon and eBay is probably where you're going to be able to find it online. If you're in the USA, uh, my book is available online at um, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, and Walmart. Very cool. Now, how – well, first let me ask you this. Do you just do um, investigations like – if you're interested in an area or if somebody can somebody call you and say, Hey, will you come check out my house? Do you, are you open to that? Well, it is rare that anyone, um, asks me to check out their house due to problems. A lot of times they'll ask me to, you know, check their house out, uh, just because they wonder if there's any ghosts or spirits there, but usually they rarely have problems, but usually the person that wants me to do that doesn't want to, it to be advertised on like social media or gotcha. doesn't want me to write a book about it or doesn't they want to limit my footage because I guess they don't want their neighbors to know that their house has been involved in a uh, paranormal investigation. So, um, and a lot, if, uh, if there are people, which there's a few people that contact me that say they're having problems with, paranormal in their house a lot of times i don't even <clears throat> have to go to their house i can usually talk them through you know over several days uh different things they can do and a lot of times ghosts of spirits want their own space so i will have individuals that have contacted me in the past that say objects are disappearing from around their house and showing up in the basement <clears throat> And they, they said, you know, they weren't sure what to do about this. And um, they also said that, uh, you know, say an uh, object would be, like, kind of thrown at them uh -huh. or at least levitated in front of them wow. to the point that they would catch it. <laughs> and I would say, well, that's a ghost or spirit, you know, trying to get your attention, probably to ask your permission if they can put that object near their area in the basement you know it's almost like everyone wants to own something whether it's a rock collection a coin collection a collection of records and ghosts of spirits are the same way except they don't have the biological physical body to really manipulate things quite as good as we do uh, some actually can so I, 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 when I talked to this person, I said, can you make a certain area in the basement where you tell everyone in your family that you're going to, like, donate certain things that this ghost spirit wants and put it in their area? And I told them to verbally tell the ghost of spirit, look, uh, the top of this bench here is your area, and we know that you like Christmas bulbs, or we're going to allow this Christmas bulb to be in your area. We know that you like uh, men's work gloves, so we're going to allow men's work gloves to sit in this area. And I said, try that and see if, you know, things die down as far as stuff missing and then showing up in a certain area in the basement. And uh, the person I was talking to did that and said that that pretty much solved the problem. And they, Very interesting. They were kind of they were kind of baffled. They said they would have never dreamed that, you know, I would have said that and that that would have worked, but they said it did. And, um, uh, I'm no longer on Facebook. When I was on Facebook, I was, uh, I had to continuously communicate with that one person, but they haven't caught up with me yet on Instagram. <laughs> now, how can people get up with you if they want to, if they want to get up with you? Well, I'm on Instagram, um, 
and I'm also on um, YouTube. Uh, my YouTube channel is uh, Paranormal Short Sessions by Keith Evans. And I'm on, uh, was it uh, Twitter? I think what? I'm pronouncing it right. Twitter? I, I'm on there, and I put uh, my uh, paranormal, uh, mainly photos. I haven't figured a way to put uh, videos on there yet, and I'm not sure if I can. But uh, I hardly ever have time to log in to uh, uh, Twitter, but I do put posts on there uh, through uh, Instagram. And how do they find you on Instagram? Uh, Instagram, uh, I think it's uh, at TitCat2006 is like my, uh, I guess that's considered my address. Can you give it one more time? Uh, I'll spell it. Uh, the at symbol uh, P E T C A T two zero zero six. There you go. So if anybody wants to reach out, if they have any questions, especially, and I will say this, um, the giving the spirit a space in your basement is a new concept for me. I haven't heard that one. So uh, you might have some folks want to reach out and find out more information about that and, you know, where where your theory goes with that. So, you know, reach out, let him know what you're thinking. Do you do email or anything like that? Uh, yes. Uh, my email is uh, uh, also uh, petcat2006 at yahoo.com. There you go. All right. Uh, I want to thank you very much because we are out of time. I want to thank you for coming on the show, uh, sharing your book uh, with us. So The Hayes House, Ghosts Are People Too. You know, make sure you go out and check that out. Make sure you get it and uh, help Keith out, get the word out on his new book. You got any and more in the making? You, uh, thank you for having me on your show. Uh, do you have any more books make uh, in the making? Well, there are several that I could... Uh, you know, that I would like to publish. Uh, but it just seems like most people, when it comes to the paranormal, would rather have hands-on and be there. Uh, and there's less paranormal uh, people reading than there are people that just want to experience the paranormal. Uh. You have, like, these paranormal uh, places where people can go and actually, you know, walk around and hear about the history. So right now, there don't, there just doesn't seem to be the necessity to publish another book because there's not that many people reading it. Uh, most of the people that read my book, the sales come from Australia, oh, wow. Ireland, Great Britain. Uh, in the U.S., most people would rather, you know, be on. YouTube watching videos. <laughs> that's that's our culture, right? Yes. All right, Keith. Thank you so much for coming out and uh, and joining us today, and and we will keep in touch. All right. Thank you. You have a great night. You too. Bye bye. Bye bye. And with that, the fire is out. I want to thank Keith so much for being on the show with me tonight. I also want to thank those of you that have connected with me on the social media aspect. You know, Facebook, Fireside Paranormal Hub, Twitter, at Fireside Parapod, P-A-R-A-P-O-D, Instagram, I think it's Fireside Paranormal Podcast, TikTok, it's Fireside Paranormal, and make sure you check out our webpage, FiresideParanormal.com, that way you can see our merch, any updates we have, and you actually see, and I don't know if many of you noticed this yet, if you have put your email in to subscribe to the show, I post the show usually the night before it broadcasts. So if you want early access to the shows, make sure you put your email in on firesideparanormal.com. And until next week, everybody, don't be afraid, only believe.